what I'd like to do today and uh, this morning is give you a very uh, brief overview of some of the work that we've done over the past five to six years in terms of serial disease management. Uh, it's focused largely in barley, but there's certainly some applicability in terms of uh, wheat disease. Before I start into the presentation, though, I, I always like to acknowledge the colleagues that I've, I've worked with over the years. Certainly, I've seen George Clayton in the audience here today. Uh, colleagues, the technical staff, uh, Attic Canada, university colleagues, provincial government colleagues, and so on. Uh, we're very fortunate to have funding from a number of different agencies. Uh, so we're very thankful for that funding for our research at Lacombe as well as across uh, Western Canada and if not more recently Canada itself. Uh, and finally I'd like to thank Farming Smarter for inviting me here today to speak to you. So if we look at barley diseases, uh, just to give you a real quick uh, overview of the main issues of the four horsemen of the barley apocalypse. The uh, first one here you'll see is skull. And that's uh, mainly an issue here in Alberta, maybe some of the cooler, wetter regions of Saskatchewan. Uh, probably one of the primary leaf diseases, though, here in Alberta and across the prairie region is the net form of net blotch. Uh, there's also a spot form of net blotch, and pathologists are a very imaginative lot as far as naming plant diseases. And last but not least, we have another disease, spot blotch, which traditionally has been an issue in the eastern prairie region but more and more we see it becoming more commonly found here in Alberta, and it's a, a pretty significant problem. Now, unfortunately, over the last five to eight years, uh, we see a fifth horseman of the barley apocalypse, which is a real concern in terms of the malting barley industry and feed industries if you're targeting monogastrics, and that's Fusarium head blight. Now, if we look at wheat, we have some significant leaf disease problems, so the septoria complex that can affect leaf tissue, can affect head tissue, and so on. Uh, tan spot, which is an issue that causes leaf disease, but it's also the same fungus that causes red smudge. Striped rust is a significant problem, or can be, depending on the year, what's developing in the Pacific Northwest, because that's where a lot of the inoculum for striped rust comes from. But also, do we have mild winters with good snow cover that facilitates overwintering? And last but not least, again, fusarium head blight. So as a pathologist, and you probably see this many, many times if a pathologist is talking to you, we like to think of disease being represented by the disease triangle. So you need a virulent pathogen in sufficient quantities, a susceptible host, and a favorable environment. So these three factors have to interact together to result in the production of disease. Now these interactions and factors associated with these uh, uh, three uh, components of the disease triangle are always under the influence of the producer or the crop consultant in terms of the recommendations that they, they can make. One foundational strategy for disease management is crop rotation. Uh, and leaving sufficient time between most crops to allow Mother Nature typically to take care of that disease problem. And that usually is decomposition of crop residues carrying plant pathogens or perhaps loss of viability in terms of pathogens that produce specialized resting structures. The problem with crop rotation is that there, in terms of disease management, is that there are many other factors that influence a farmer's cropping system choice. Right from commodity price, local market opportunities, so if you're a barley grower in southern Alberta, you might be able to market into the feed end of things and get prices that actually approach uh, malting prices. There may be issues related to on-farm feed requirements, so you have no choice but to grow crops in a fairly tight rotation. Finally, you may have other crops that you can grow, but you're either not familiar with them, or you've had significant issues, harvestability issues, weed management issues in the past, so you're a little bit uh, reluctant to grow those crops. Field peas fit into that category. The other issue with field peas is that these other crops may also have significant disease issues. And one of the big issues in field peas has been the Phanomyces. 
So if we look at crop rotation, and I've been influenced by many people over the years, certainly George Clayton has played a big role in terms of where I'm at right now as far as a research scientist, and I can advocate crop rotation, but if the reality is that a producer has to tighten up their rotations for valid reasons, what can I recommend then in terms of managing issues? So if a producer needs to produce silage for on-farm feed requirements, how do they mitigate some of that risk? And we started some work in the mid-90s uh, based on some questions that came from Gordon Frank and Dave Spencer, two crop specialists at uh, Brooks and Medicine Hat. And they had clients growing silage barley, and barley and barley and barley with significant leaf disease problems. At that time, we looked at the idea of gene deployment, or, or rotating the varieties that we grow. The trial I want to talk to you about is sort of uh, uh, the next generation phase of, of that work. Looking at strategies that are easy to implement, don't necessarily result in a lot of input costs, and allow that producer to manage that risk. So if we look at the trial, we looked at using variety rotation. We looked at the concept of mixing varieties. Not a new technology, it was something that's been advocated since the 50s. And we also looked at intercropping, and lots of interest in intercropping. And we started the trial in 2008, and we had uh, three sort of phases, three, a three-year cycle of, of rotation over uh, that period, and we looked at the impact of these different uh, strategies. So the first treatment that we looked at here was simply growing the same variety year after year after year. So that was sundry barley. We then looked at it in the idea of barley variety rotation. So we could reduce disease somewhat by simply changing the variety that we grew each year, changing the genetics. We then looked at mixtures, but we kept the components of that mixtures, the varieties, the same each year in those in those three years of that three-year rotational sequence. We then looked at changing the genetics of those components each year. So over that three-year period, instead of using the same three components, we used nine different sources of genetics in terms of uh, barley uh, varieties. We then looked at intercropping. We looked at, again, the same concept, keeping the same varieties uh, over that three year period, whether it was uh, the same barley variety, oat variety, or triticale, and we looked at spring triticale. We looked at the same concept with spring triticale, but where we changed the components, and again, we could further drive down disease development. We also wanted to look at winter triticale, because there's lots of interest in cover crops, and if you look at the winter triticale, we seeded it in the spring at the same time as the oat and barley, all mixed together, and the idea is that winter triticale would form a vegetative barrier of leaf material to prevent spore uh, dispersal from the infested barley residue and maybe would help to reduce disease development. So we again used uh, the same varieties in that component of oat barley and winter triticale where we changed them each year. And you can see as we added diversity, especially in terms of uh, changing the components, and using intercrops, we could drive that disease down. And this was at Lacombe, a fairly high-risk disease site. At Lethbridge, we had the same trial with Bob Blackshaw, and Tim McAllister was involved with it, and a very similar picture. Highest levels of disease. Our risk was somewhat lower at Lethbridge, drier conditions. Uh, but again, adding diversity, and I won't go into this in a lot of detail to stay on time, reduced our level of leaf disease significantly. So we could try, we could manage that disease risk by simply adding diversity in the form of barley mixtures or intercrops. What about yield? Well this is uh, silage yield on a dry weight basis and again if you look at the pattern here our lowest tonnage were, was with our continuous barley production same variety. There was a trend where we looked at uh, variety rotation, or we looked at mixtures with the same varieties, not significantly different though. But once we went to a barley mixture with different components each year, we saw a significant increase in tonnage. But it was our intercrops that provided the highest uh, 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 level of productivity in terms of that uh, particular experiment. 
What about Lethbridge? A little bit of a similar picture, but, a, but somewhat different. Lower disease levels. So we likely had other factors related to the response of those different treatments, especially the intercrops. But again, as we added diversity for most of the treatments, we could significantly increase our tonnage. So what were our conclusions in this uh, particular trial? Well, the addition of diversity, either in terms of crop types or genetics, helped to reduce disease and improve silage productivity. And that in intercrop of oat, triticale, and barley, if you talked with Tim McAllister here at Lethbridge, provided a very good quality silage uh, for uh, cattle production. Uh, and this effect was especially the case where we changed the components each year. So we added more genetic diversity. Uh, the other thing that I would say is it's very, very important, if I've learned one thing from this study, is to choose the most resistant varieties possible. So if you're looking at using mixtures or intercropping, try to choose a variety with an excellent package of resistance. So resistance, excellent strategy using a variety where the breeders, the pathologists, that team that develops those varieties have incorporated resistance that, that means that that variety is not affected by the disease of concern. You can see this here with Netwatch on Harrington, susceptible variety, versus on Rivers, a feed variety that has a fairly good levels of Netwatch resistance. So we wanted to look at the impact of resistance. We had some interest in seed treatments, and I'll talk a bit more about that a little later on, as well as fungicide uh, applications. So do we see an interaction between variety and fungicide applications? So we looked at seed treatment. We looked at a flag leaf stage fungicide application with a product called Twinline. We looked at variety resistance. We used a susceptible, an intermediate, and a resistant variety. Uh, at Lacombe, the other site was Malford, where our focus was on Netwatch, Lacombe was Skull, and at Charlottetown PEI, way over in the Maritimes, and uh, our colleagues there looked at both Net form Netwatch and Skull. So we looked at things like percent leaf area diseased, uh, and grain yield, and kernel characteristics, and so on. And I just want to show you some of the disease results. So if we look at uh, Lacombe, and we look at, look at the combined data over uh, that period from 2013 to 2016, uh, we saw a significant interaction between variety and fungicide in terms of the level of leaf disease on the penultimate leaf. So not the flag leaf, which is the leaf next to the head, but the next leaf down. So if we look at uh, the susceptible variety, we saw a significant and substantial reduction in leaf disease level by simply applying that flag leaf emergence fungicide, that twin line. If we look at uh, the varieties itself, Busby, intermediate level of scald resistance, that genetic package provided a significant level of control of that leaf disease. And uh, we, didn't, we saw somewhat of a reduction in disease where we applied fungicide to that Busby variety. Gatsby, uh, a package of resistance that was even better, much lower levels of disease, but we did see somewhat of a, a, a fairly small response to fungicides. Certainly not the same as what we observed with uh, Xena. Uh, we also saw an interaction uh, if we looked at total leaf disease. So scald wasn't the only thing, it was our target disease, it was the main disease, but we also had some net blotch developing, spot blotch and other things. So if we look at the flag leaf minus one, so the, not, the, not the flag leaf, but the next leaf down, very similar picture, that genetics in, the genetics in Busby, the genetics in, in uh, Gatsby provided a significant level of control of that disease. Uh, where we applied twin line, we saw a reduction in disease, especially with our susceptible variety. Very similar picture if we looked at the third leaf from the head. So the flag leaf minus two. So not the flag, not the penultimate leaf, but the third leaf from the head. So what about yield? Well, we didn't have a significant interaction of variety and fungicide because we did see some response to fungicide with our resistant varieties, especially because we had other leaf diseases that were present. But certainly with our 
fungicide. We can improve overall that, that, that period from 2013 to 2016, yields by about 10 bushels per acre. We, we also saw the benefit of disease resistance, but especially where you had a very high level of resistance that we observed in things like Gadsby. So we had a significant increase in yield with Gadsby, and some of that, I think, was due to reduced levels of disease. So if we look at fungicides, uh, and we look at tight rotations, and we, or we look at tight rotations, we look at the fact that we may not necessarily have varieties that we want to grow that have resistance, what that means then is we need to look at other tools. We can use fungicide application to manage leaf disease and improve crop productivity. The thing is, is that we need to use those fungicides wisely. We need to hit the right target, uh, and there may be some other aspects related to uh, using fungicides in a different manner that may be something uh, to consider. So if we look at the other trial that we conducted, uh, and this was across Canada, right from Beaver Lodge to Lethbridge, several sites in Saskatchewan, Brandon, Manitoba, and Charlottetown PEI. We looked at seed treatment uh, because there was some indication seed treatment might actually provide some early season management of leaf disease risk. We looked at PGR. We were interested if a PGR reduces lodging, lodging may increase our level of disease, PGRs may reduce it. We also looked at the flag leaf timing uh, and we looked at uh, head emergence timing. So flag leaf was with twin line, a combination of a triazole and a strobularin fungicide, so pyroclostrobin and metconazole. Uh, Procero is a triazole based fungicide with two components, tebaconazole and prothiaconazole. And again, we looked at these disease levels, we looked at uh, yield characteristics and so on. The first slide here is just some data from Beaver Lodge, Alberta from 2014. And the point of this slide is to illustrate if you don't have a risk of leaf disease, there's no point in spraying a fungicide. You're not going to see a benefit as far as plant health, and you're not going to see a yield response, and in fact, your net returns are going to be lower. And we saw the same pattern in other years in beaver lodge. So if there's no significant risk of disease, as that crop is moving from stem elongation to flag leaf emergence, to head emergence, to anthesis, there's not a need, there's no need to put a fungicide on. It's a waste of money. And the more times you put a fungicide on in that crop, the more selection pressure there is in that pathogen population to adapt to that particular fungicide, especially if you're using the same product. So if we look at data averaged uh, over uh, that four year period, and we look at percent leaf area diseased, these are the main effect treatments, so the effect of seed treatment versus no seed treatment, PGR versus no PGR, flag leaf fungicide versus no flag leaf fungicide, and so on. Uh, we can see that we had a small reduction in leaf disease at the end of the growing season by simply using a seed treatment. Not really huge, but a significant effect. Uh, we didn't see any impact of the PGR on disease, which was good to see. Uh, but we did see significant impact and reduction in disease with a flag leaf fungicide application, again that's twin line, and also with the head emergence application of fungicide. We did see uh, some interactions, and here we see an interaction between uh, seed treatment and, uh, and, and uh, fungicide timing. So here, if we look at the first set of uh, treatments here, we're simply comparing no uh, no seed treatment used, and we're looking at whether we sprayed a fungicide at flag, heading, or the dual application, so flag and heading. You can see a significant reduction in disease, but no real difference between the three treatments, single at flag, single at head, or the dual. If you look at the two light blue bars where we got no seed treatment versus seed treatment applied, you can see the, the impact of that seed treatment on leaf disease at the end of the growing season. But it was really the later applications of fungicide that provided the best level of, of control. What about yields? Well, these again are the main effect treatments, and there was a weak effect of seed treatment. And that yellow number you see there is 
the yield increase compared to the check for each of the respective treatment combinations. See treatment, so just under a bushel per acre, so it might not necessarily, necessarily be economic. PGR, we saw about a three, just under a three bushel per acre increase uh, in yield. But it was really with the flag and the head emergence fungicide where we saw a four to a five bushel per acre yield increase overall. Uh, we did see some interactions between fungicide timing. So uh, with our check, our lowest yields, by putting a fungicide on a flag leaf, we could increase yield by five, uh, just under six bushels per acre. By putting it on a head emergence, seven bushels per acre. And by putting it on both a flag and a heading, nine bushels per acre overall uh, from that four-year period. Again, it's important to look at the economics. And that dual application, even though we had our highest yields, may not necessarily be economic. Now, one of the other things that we, we, were, we were just finishing up on is uh, that head emergence application could also have other benefits, especially in terms of uh, reducing the level of deoxynivolanol or DON contamination in that harvested barley. Very important for the maltsters and brewers. So we didn't have any significant effect of, of seed treatment on DON, no significant effect of PGR, no significant effect of the flag leaf fungicide application, but with our head emergence, we could bring that level of DON down from uh, just over two parts per million, not acceptable for malt status, I, I, I might add, down to about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 parts per million. So from being not acceptable to being something that the maltsters would consider for malt status. So a significant impact in terms of the producer's bottom line. Uh, and again, these flag leaf for head emergence applications also tended to give us our best levels of disease management in terms of leaf disease issues. Uh, we saw uh, an interaction, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, uh, where we saw an interaction between seed treatment, PGR, and head emergence. The take home message from this slide is that if you look at those dark blue bars, it really didn't matter whether you used a seed treatment or a PGR or not, as long as you put on that, that head emergence application fungicide, it helped to reduce DAWN. Uh, we saw a similar pattern at Melford, not as distinct, no effect of PGR, no effect of seed treatment. With the flag leaf fungicide, we actually saw a slight increase in DAWN, not something that we want to see. The flag leaf fungicide is a combination of a triazole and a strobularin. The recommendation coming out of the States and all of the, the great work that's been done there on fusarium head blight, the work in Europe, indicates not to use a fungicide that is based on strobularin alone or even in a mixture. So this is one year of data. We need to look at this a little more closely. Uh, but if you look at the head emergence application, we saw a significant reduction in dawn. Not to the same extent as if we observed it in the head. So these sites were chosen because they were in areas where Fusarium graminearum was very well established. Uh, we had uh, good uh, moisture conditions from the pathogen's point of view, and we had levels of dawn in our check treatments that were well above one part per million. So if we look at the take-home messages, seed treatments may have some impact and benefit, and especially where your variety is highly susceptible and you have a higher disease risk. PGRs, perhaps when there's a risk of lodging. But one of the things that I didn't mention is that with the PGRs, we saw about a 1.6 to 2 day increase in maturity, which may not be desirable, compared to fungicide application, which was about a half a day increase in maturity. And we also saw a reduction in grain size with the PGR. Flag leaf for head emergence fungicide, gave us our most consistent impact, and especially when our level, our level of disease risk was moderate to high. So if diseases are a concern in your crop, targeting the upper canopy leaves in that cereal canopy, whether it's barley or wheat, is going to be the target that you want to hit with a fungicide. Uh, if we look at variety resistance, or dual application, we saw 
our, we saw a dual benefit of that head emergence application, reduction in leaf disease levels, and a reduction in dawn. So you're seeing uh, a dual benefit to that head emergence application. Resistant varieties tended to be not as responsive to fungicide uh, inputs. They provide some peace of mind in terms of managing that risk. They protect yield while reducing input costs. The problem, though, is that some of those varieties didn't have a complete package of resistance to all of the leaf diseases that are of concern. So they may be something of an issue. So we didn't see a synergistic impact of seed treatment and in-crop fungicide application, and I think that may reflect the seed treatment that was used. So I'll quickly go through the next set of slides. We're almost done here. I've had the fortune of visiting Australia uh, on three separate occasions since 2008. It's really helped me in terms of expanding my horizons as far as disease management, looking at what they're doing down there. Sometimes very similar cropping systems, oilseed canola, barley canola barley, or canola wheat canola. And one of the pathologists that I've worked with quite closely is Mark McLean and his two assistants, Henry and Georgia. And Mark has been looking at uh, seed treatments as a way of controlling or mitigating some of that risk of leaf disease early, early in the season. So this is a trial just out uh, at Horsham, 2016, uh, where they looked at a seed treatment, Sestiva, or Xenium, it's Fluxoxapyrad, it's the same active ingredient that's in uh, Preaxor, and some of the new products that are coming out, Nexcore and so on from BASF. Uh, they looked at Procero as their leaf disease, and they put that on either at growth stage 31, uh, or 32, and at flag leaf emergence or growth stage 39. So if you look at uh, the no fungicide applied, the check treatment, about 6.9 tons a, uh, a hectare, uh, the slight increase, probably not significant, to 7.1 with that Procero at that early stage. We still saw a significant level of disease, although it was reduced. Procero, we could increase that yield even more and reduce the level of disease. But the interesting thing was the seed treatment alone substantial reduction of leaf disease at the end of the growing season. These ratings were done on October 7th. This particular trial would have been seeded in May uh, at that particular location. And then Mark looked at combination treatments. Sestiva with Procero at flag leaf or the dual application. And there was some additional benefit there. So if I look at that work, I look at the work that we've done since the late 1990s, want to hear my thoughts as far as fungicide use in Western Canada. If you're concerned about early season development of disease, one thing that we should start to consider is using a seed treatment, especially a product that moves with the water transpiration stream from that seed up into the developing leaf tissue, the first true leaf, second true leaf, third true leaf, and so on. That gives you that early season management and perhaps some peace of mind. Then we come back in at antithesis, we top up our leaf disease management, but we also get the added benefit of trying to suppress the level of fusarium head blight and the level of dawn. Of course, you could still go in a little earlier. If I was to look at this, uh, I would let what's happening in the crop dictate my approach to the timings that I use, and so on. So we saw a lot of leaf disease developing at the herbicide timing. Maybe wait until when the penultimate leaf, or perhaps even the third leaf from the head, is coming out. Those are key leaves for grain filling and yield. Hit it early with that fungicide, and then come back in with a different product. One of the advantages of looking at a seed treatment and a head emergence, if we look at a product like Xenium or Sestiva, it's an SDHI. Uh, fungicide class 7, totally different active ingredient versus some of the, the head, head blight fungicides, which tend to be mostly triazole based. So with that, again, I can't emphasize the importance of in-crop scouting and knowing what's happening in that, that field and letting that dictate what you do in terms of disease risk. So scouting is going to be key, looking at what's developing in that crop, especially as it's, as it's progressing from stem elongation into flag leaf emergence and then into 
pet emergence in terms of pulling the trigger to spray a fungicide for leaf disease management. And with that, I'll end there, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. systemic with fungicides and mostly foliar fungicides I suspect we class as systemic but you're showing that if you spray at a flag leaf you're it's a little bit less efficacious than spraying at early any which suggests to me that there's some real limitations in this uh, systemic term that we use a lot different than systemic herbicides you want to comment absolutely uh, when you hear the term systemic, if you look at all of the fungicides, except for maybe a, a small number that are very, very not commonly used, would not be used in field crop production in Western Canada, most of them, if they're systemic, they're locally systemic. So they penetrate the wax layer and into the first sort of layer, the epidermis of that leaf tissue or the plant tissue that you spray. It don't move beyond that. Some products, you may have heard of the term translaminar, move from the top part of the, 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 the leaf where the, the drop of the fungicide lands to the bottom part of the leaf. Some products are actually even more systemic, but they move with the water transpiration stream. So if you spray at the three leaf stage, you're going to protect the healthy green leaf tissue at that time. As soon as that fourth leaf comes out, it's totally unprotected because the fungicide, even though it's systemic, isn't moving backwards in that leaf and into the growing plant and up to the growing point and into that developing fourth leaf. So we need to be very cautious. Now the seed treatment and this fluxoxapyrad is something that's quite mobile in the plant and it, wore, it, it, it moves with the water transpiration stream. So the, the the seedling roots are picking up water, it's picking up some of that fungicide, and it's moving with that water up into the first true leaf, the second true leaf, and so on. So, very good question. And I, certainly, in terms of systemic activity, in terms of fungicides, it's one way. It's from the base of the leaf to the tip of the leaf, typically. Okay, uh, I haven't seen any other questions coming via Twitter. I'll give you one last call for questions for Kelly at the mic. And with that, I am always reminded, uh, Kelly, how you do such a wonderful job of uh, explaining complex things in a way we can all understand. I know it's a keep coming up from many barriers where we didn't uh, put a lot of inputs into the crops, and, you know, didn't know a lot of these things, and you really helped me understand it. And so thank you for being a clear communicating scientist and for joining us here today at Farming Smarter.